So where is the likely position of the superior labial artery? Now the artery usually runs above or within the vermilion border. The papers that I've reviewed have described it routinely in the vermilion border or slightly above. It's usually also beneath orbicularis oris, sometimes within orbicularis oris, and occasionally on top of orbicularis oris. In fact, the ratios are about 60% of the time beneath orbicularis oris, about 35% within orbicularis oris, and 5% above. And that could actually even be in the same patient, because it probably wiggles around a little bit on occasions. Uh, and of course, there are anomalous versions of this artery. In fact, when I was discussing this with Julie Horn recently, she's kindly shared an amazing video of a, an artery pulsating near the wet dry border. Now I've looked into this and actually this is a known anomaly. Back in the 70s people had discovered this and it's called a caliber persistent artery. It's essentially an anomaly that around two to three percent and and Julie actually said to me she thinks around two in 50 patients and when I looked into the data I found three percent of people actually have this anomaly. So this is interesting but it is an anomaly. The normal position of the artery I don't believe is at the wet dry border. Um, but it can be, and this is the what we all face as each time we inject. There are variations, but we're once again talking about the average position of the artery. So look now at this cross section of a lip. This is the most important bit of anatomy that you will see. This is a histological specimen cut directly long ways across the lip, and you can see where the artery tends to lie. We have the muscle that runs down the middle of the lip, anterior to that, a little bit of hypodermic fat, and then the dermis. And on the other side, you have underneath the, mu the muscle is where the artery usually is. As we've said, it's not always at that exact point, but it's usually just inferior to orbicularis oris. Now, if you picture where your injection is, it's on that anterior surface in most cases. Whether you're horizontal or vertical, it's, it's in, it should be on the anterior aspect of the lip. So which are these vessels that are vulnerable? So there are really only two vessels that you're likely to hit directly in the chin. So you've got the mental artery and the submental artery. Of course, you also have the inferior labial artery, which is very nearby. But with just, to, just thinking purely about the chin, it really should be one of those two vessels. And particularly for augmentation of the chin, it's more the submental artery. So this artery comes, as it suggests, underneath the mandible. So the submental artery will curve round and then supplies the anterior part of the chin. Uh, but as we'll see, it's a lot more complex than that simple diagram that you see in the textbooks. So the submental artery supplies some very important structures in the neck. Now, if you think about where that artery is passing from the anterior part of the chin towards the neck and just super, superior to it are the muscles that would stabilize the floor of the mouth while you swallow. So the digastric muscle, the geniohyoid muscle, the mylohyoid muscle, and the stylohyoid muscle can all be affected. There's also, in theory, in some people, a connection, an anastomosis between the sublingual artery and the submental artery. And this is very, very important because if you are injecting with high volumes, as we do when injecting the chin, in theory, you could affect the tongue's blood supply. And this is probably one of the worst injuries because a necrotic tongue is, uh, is extremely debilitating. So it's worth thinking about the complex anatomy that is, a, that is possible around here and not just thinking about the simplified versions that you see in the textbooks. Um, what is it next that you need in order to create a treatment design? And the next step, of course, is the anatomy and the physiology of the face. So there are the two elements of this. The, the anatomy itself is simply what are you actually injecting? What are the layers and the structures um, that you're actually putting your product into? And how is that going to change how your product behaves over time? Because it's if it was just a, a shape or a sculpture, you know, like, like when you're sculpting with clear clay, it's all one material then you could just focus on the aesthetic, but we're not doing that. We're actually injecting a moving structure that has a, a function, um, and we don't want to upset the function while also getting a good, create, a, a good aesthetic result. So you need to think about the anatomy also in a, in a dynamic form, because this is one of the early mistakes people tend to make, is you, you think about the before and afters in a photograph, and we don't think about the dynamics of the face. Remember the point of your face, the purpose of your face, is to communicate. That's why it has a different anatomy to other muscles in our body. If you look at the muscles in any other part of your body, effectively they run from bone to bone and they move bones and they basically move the organism around. The difference with your face is that the, the muscles run from the bone to the surface of the skin. 
Their only purpose is to move the skin so that we can communicate non-verbally with each other. And that is a survival skill. You know, if you cannot communicate effectively with your tribe, you're at a huge disadvantage. So remembering that the aesthetic is not just static, but also dynamic is also an essential part of the skill. We need to be controlling dynamic beauty, not just um, the static beauty that many people focus on in the photographs. So these are, these are rules, ratios, and functions of the face that come from an understanding of the anatomy. Um, and this comes from not just knowing the muscles and not just knowing the arteries, but actually knowing the depth and, and the position and the movement of those, of those uh, structures so that you can start to create treatment designs that fit around the risk, which is the complications side of things, but also do only affect movement in a good way. So harmonizing movement that may be unattractive and certainly not stopping movement that you need uh, in, in order to communicate in a, in a positive way. So these are the anatomical structures. You need to know all of the tissues and all of them are relevant. So your ligaments, your connective tissues, SMAS, muscle, fat, deep fat pads and superficial fat pads. You can check out all of our other videos on those which give a really good introduction to all of those structures and then how you inject around them. And of course, the structures that we're terrified of injuring. So blood vessels, so arteries in particular, but also the veins, um, the nerves, the, the glands, all of those things we don't want to injure or uh, unnecessarily go near. All of these need to become things that you design treatments around to minimize risk. You're going to understand the movement. So talk us through the layout of the lower face muscles. So there's some, there's some interesting differences with the muscles in the lower face compared with other muscles in your body. Um, if you think about what the average muscle is doing is it's connecting bone to bone. So most of the, the other muscles, uh, when you contract them, there's an insertion and an origin point, which te tends to be bone to bone. What's different about the face in particular is that you have a, lo a lot of muscles connected either to other muscles or into the skin. And that's because there's so much movement required. And um, that depends which part you look at. I'm talking mainly in this case with the anterior face. So the anterior face, all those muscles that control the mouth and elevate the lip and, uh, and, there, and even move the chin are all skin to bone so, or bone to skin, depending on the way you're looking at it. Um, the muscles of mastication are a bit different. They are the classic bone-to-bone -bone connections, and you don't see those connections in the surface of the skin. So that's the first general layout. Uh, when we cover the fat pads, which is an another video you should have a look at, um, th this is why there's this interesting layout where the muscle and the fat pads are like tiles on a roof, where they're stacked together, and the deep fat pads are actually on top of other muscles. So yeah, check that video out, and they'll tell you more about that. Uh, but that's the first thing that's different about the muscles in the face, is that is that they don't have that classic uh, connections that the rest of the skeletal muscle does. The next thing is to think about like what, how are they actually supporting and holding the structures. And I, I kind of think about a lot of the mid face being basically hanging off the zygoma and the maxilla. So all the, all those bone, bony attachments are either on the maxilla or the zygoma, and they're hanging the, the mouth, the nose, um, the chin is all supported on those muscles anteriorly. Um, and I do kind of almost imagine it being sort of hanging there supporting, but there are obviously elevators and depressors, which we'll look at in detail. So it's really important, first of all, not to get too focused on individual ligaments first, but to picture the distribution of the ligaments, because that really helps your understanding a lot more. Um, if you actually look at the distribution of the ligaments, most of them fall on an angle between the lateral and the anterior face. And this is the the change in the function of the face is, is overlaid by the anatomy. So as you move from being focused more on communication to focus more on mastication, that's where the line of ligaments is. So they are almost forming that boundary. So if you actually have a look at this line of ligaments, it starts really with the superior temporal septum. You then have the orbicularis oculi retaining ligament and the, in particular the lateral orbital thickening which falls on this line. You have the zygomatic cutaneous ligament. By far the strongest aspect of that is right on the angle of the zygoma on this line. Following on underneath that, along the master, you have the upper masteric cutaneous ligaments and then the mandibular septum beneath that. And onwards, finally, to meet with the mandibular cutaneous ligament. So this is the line of ligaments that holds the anterior face in place. But it's not really that involved with aesthetic injectables anyway. And moving on down to the platysmal buns, what do we need to know about them? 
So this is a very superficial muscle. It's like a sheet, but then it collects into these bands um, and essentially you can relax it. It can be, it's, it's connected into the SMAS. So if you relax it, sometimes you see an improvement in jawline. So it can really make a good difference. And, and that's why it's called the, the Nefertiti lift if you do a toxin treatment is that you, you create that Nefertiti type jawline uh, in a percentage of people. Um, side effects, uh, similarly actually to treating the lower face is that if you occasionally I've seen a few people get asymmetry in their lower mouth and it's because the muscle isn't actually as neat as it is in the textbook and it's often woven into those depressors and you can you can sometimes see it, you know, the depressor angularosaurus and the platysmal band are kind of woven together. So occasionally get people get asymmetry when they smile. I think it's when you're injecting very high up, um, but it's worth knowing about. <laughs>